Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to blather on for a while and then it, like in between uh, topics, I'll stop and I'll take some questions. So that way you don't have to remember questions right till the end and we could have a, a nice dialogue because I don't want to just talk at you. I want us to speak together and I want to hear what your concerns are and if I'm answering your questions. So uh, today, as uh, Stephanie said, we're going to be talking about nutrition and en uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy for patients with uh, pancreatic cancer. Of course, my slide. Okay, so just a little disclaimer that of course, what I'm talking about here is very broad. It may or may not be relevant to you, but what I'm hoping to do is give you information that you could take back to your medical team um, and ask questions. You know, I want you to be armed with information because that's really important um, to your own care and to the care um, of your loved ones. So maybe we could just start with a show of hands um, because I find like in my own practice, it sort of runs the gamut of people who like have really good control of like the information they have on nutrition, what to do, how to eat, all the way to people feeling that they have no control, they don't know what to do, they're being told by family caregivers what to do, that goes against what they want to do. Caregivers are at their wit's ends because they don't know what to do. So how many of you, uh, maybe just a raise of hands with a little uh, hand raising function, feels like, you know, you got the nutrition, you know what to do. So there are only a couple of you that I see on my screen. I can't see all of you, but uh, there are a couple of you. How many of you, maybe another uh, hand raising question, how many of you already know about pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy? Yeah, we don't have very many hands there. We have a no. couple. No, yeah. not many. Oh, we maybe have, we have a few more coming up. We have a few more, right? Okay, yeah. so we're going to talk about all of this to give you guys some information and uh, and I'll, I'll tell you that as clinicians, we're not always good with all of this. We're not good at giving you the information. So that's part of the reason uh, Craig's Cause sets, sets these talks up, right? To give you the information that might be lacking within your hospital centers. So um, what we know, just talking numbers right now, is that in pa patients with pancreatic cancer, weight loss and malnutrition is extremely common. It's often part of the uh, diagnosis, right? We become jaundiced, we've lost a ton of weight. Um, and that weight, while yes, there's some fat that's lost, there's also muscle that's lost. And that becomes important when we're trying to just get a, you know, on with our daily activities and we're feeling fatigued because we lost a lot of muscle. So it's a very common problem in this type of cancer. And us as nutritionists, we go crazy about it because it brings us into this downward spiral where the weight loss and the muscle loss all lead to sort of fatigue we're not able to do our stuff as we normally would want to, as we normally do. And we suffer because of that. You know, we're unhappy that we can't engage in our work and our family life and our social life. Um, and with that comes more just lack of appetite leading to further weight loss. And this downward spiral leads us to not being able to tolerate our treatments well, whether they are like preparing ourselves for surgery or for chemotherapy. Um, so what we want to do is get in early and treat this malnutrition, empower our patients with information to try to stop this downward spiral. So what are the goals when you see a dietitian? What would the person's goals be for you? We want to make sure you're eating enough calories so that we try to maintain weight, okay? Um, oftentimes there's a sort of bias in someone who is overweight. Oh, they're losing weight. It's probably a good thing. Maybe not in this context. We want to really try to maintain weight. Um, we also want to eat enough protein to maintain our muscle. Proteins build muscle, the building blocks of muscle. And we'll go through some protein foods in a bit to give you an idea of what kind of foods to choose to protect our muscle. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure that we're going to go through all the trouble of eating calories and protein, that they're very well absorbed and that they stay in our body and that our body utilizes these nutrients appropriately. This is a problem in patients with pancreatic cancer, and I'm going to explain to you why shortly. We also want to just make sure that your digestive symptoms are controlled. If you're nauseous, if you're vomiting because of treatments, or if you have a lot of diarrhea because your food you are eating isn't being absorbed, we want to try to stop that. 
And then, which I find is very, very important, which not many people always talk about is you want to derive some pleasure in eating. You don't want to force feed yourself things that you think are good for you, uh, but you're miserable doing it. You know, we have to find a nice balance of pleasure and trying to meet these nutritional goals. So if you're losing weight, what do you eat? So as I mentioned, we're looking for calories so that we sort of maintain our weight or we stop the weight loss. And we're looking for high protein foods to feed our muscles. So here's a list of these different types of food. And you know, it could be a mix and match. There are some things on these lists that you don't like, for example, and you don't need to eat them because there'll be other things that you do like. So some people love avocados, some people don't like them. They're not part of their usual diets. So we'll find something else that works instead, you know, for calories. Same with protein. Some people are a vegetarian or vegan and do not eat animal proteins. So we'll lean more towards the plant-based proteins, the soy, the legumes, the nuts, the seeds. It's all okay. Um, we really want to work within what you like to eat to optimize how many calories you're getting in to stop weight loss and how much protein you're getting in to um, maintain your muscle. And I would be remiss, my physio and kinesiology friends would be very upset with me if I didn't mention the importance of physical activity in combination with protein uh, to maintain muscle mass. Um, essentially, it doesn't mean going to the gym or running a marathon. It could be as simple as walking every single day, even days that you're feeling bad, walking even a minute just around your living room table is better than nothing. Sitting is better than lying down. All these things help uh, maintain your muscle and thus maintain your ability to do your daily activities, okay? So very important. So calories, protein, we, we, we've sort of run the gamut on that. Other tips, if we don't have an appetite, we're losing weight because we don't have an appetite. So eating small, frequent meals, what does that mean? It means, okay, your three square meals, that might be a bit smaller than usual, but we're going to supplement what we're not eating at a, a mealtime with snacks. So little snackies every two, three hours. If you can't even fathom the idea of sitting for a meal, then just grazing all day long, just picking on little, little bites here and there to try to, and those bites being rich in both calories and protein will be a good way to try to get enough in without causing undue distress of trying to sit at the table with a big pile of food in your face. You know, when you're not hungry, you're not hungry. So we have to try to find means to, to um, get the food in. This uh, pattern of eating is also easier on the digestion. And we'll look a little bit uh, further into this uh, presentation to see what I mean about that. Um, if you're followed by a dietitian, you might be given some supplements to take. So there are oral nutritional supplements. Uh, so those milkshake type drinks that are like meal replacements uh, that might be um, suggested to you to take. You might be suggested a whey protein isolate powder. Uh, again, just to give you a little bit of extra protein to help with your muscle mass. Um, medium chain triglyceride oil. So that's a fancy name for a specific type of oil that's just digested differently than your usual, you know, avocado oil, olive oil, canola oil. Um, easier again on the digestion. So we could really absorb all the calories from that fat. And then you might also be given a multivitamin or a fat soluble vitamins. I think of course in Canada, we're all vitamin D deficient. So I think of vitamin D as an example, other fat soluble vitamins are vitamins A, E and K. Um, I would not take any of these without uh, talking to your healthcare team first because you might not need them. And we don't want to take things we don't need. If we want to try to get uh, from food, our alarm nutrients as much as possible, but in a pinch, when things aren't going so well, these could be uh, helpful tools to uh, get the nutrition in. So I'm gonna stop there before continuing on this oh my God slide to maybe just ask if you guys have any questions at this point regarding calories, small frequent meals, protein, supplements, anything you might, that, that comes up, just these are general dietary guidelines for patients with pancreatic cancer. Whether you're a patient or a healthcare or um, uh, uh, um, caregiver, excuse me. Okay, there's so there's some hands that just got raised. 
No, it's the, the guidelines would not be different for uh, someone with pancreatic cancer or peanut uh, or regular you and I. Um, chicken is fine. Red meat in moderation, not a problem. Not a problem. It depends on what he enjoys. Um, we have a question from Paul and a couple in chat. I'll get Jessica to read a couple of the questions in the chat after Paul's gone. One, I, I actually just published a review, uh, I guess it was about six months ago now, uh, looking at diet and exercise interventions for pancreatic cancer specifically. And one of the most researched is fish oil uh, to decrease inflammation mm -hmm. uh, for, for multiple reasons. They're looking at fish oil and pancreatic cancer. Uh, it's so hard to say whether it does anything because all the formulations are different. Compliance mm -hmm. to taking the formula is different. Um, oftentimes they put the fish oil in something like an insurer and mm -hmm. patients just don't drink it because they don't want to, because it's gross. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's really hard. The, the, the physiology is there. There is a pathway where we know that omega-3s uh, decrease inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, in just general cachexia work, it hasn't been shown um, 100%. But if, if your mom is tolerating it, mm -hmm. there's no harm. There's no harm. So right. that's fine. That's... HMB, I know less about specifically for, for a pancreatic cancer. But again, mm -hmm. as a metabolite of leucine, we know leucine is helpful for sarcopenia. And sarcopenia, by the way, for everyone, it's loss of muscle. But mm -hmm. not only loss of muscle, but a com combination of loss of muscle, loss of strength, and a loss of ability of doing your stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's those three things together that make someone weak and eating protein and certain types of protein like whey, which is rich in certain types of building blocks of protein that make our muscles strong and make our muscles grow and repair. So HMB that Paul is mentioning is one is part of that pathway. Mm -hmm. And there has been some work done looking at HMB specifically. Um, again, I always, there's no harm in it. I always look at the patient's tolerance, how to, right. if they're able to take the supplement that's, that has the HMB, that's the one I would recommend. It's mm -hmm. the most expensive one. I call it the Cadillac of all supplements. That's how I present it to people because mm -hmm. that's what it is. <laughs> uh, all right. So, yeah. yeah, from the chat, we have a question from Rosie about coconut oil. Is, is that okay? Sure, there's a part of coconut oil is something is that medium chain triglyceride stuff. So the fat in coconut oil is easily absorbed uh, or can be a little bit more easily absorbed, part of the fat. Um, would I sit there like some people suggest in you know uh, weird internet sites eating coconut oil by the spoonful? No, but if I were to use it in my cooking, the way you would use any other fat, I, there's no problem with that. Okay. And it tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Maxine said, how do you judge how many enzymes to take when eating small snacks? Ah, okay. So we'll, we'll get into that. Okay. We'll get into that. If you could <laughs> cool. hold that question, hold I will time. answer that question shortly. All right. Um, and how do pancreatic enzymes such as creon impact diabetics? My father's creon increased his sugar levels from crystal mm -hmm. yeah well you, i guess you're absorbing more so if if your father is on insulin there might be some adjustments that need to be made uh but you're absorbing more so uh, yeah i could see that happening for sure and it's it's actually i think one of the side effects of creon okay um then we have a couple more. If you are lactose intolerant, what is an alternative to whey protein? Um, I've had people, despite their lactose intolerance, tolerate whey. Uh, but if that's not your case, you could use a plant-based protein. That's fine. 
it, you, it, it, the problem with plant-based proteins sometimes is just a, a matter of the absorption and you have to be careful about what's inside the protein powder itself. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are very rich in fiber. And if you're experiencing diarrhea or, you know, bloat, or even if you have a, a, a low appetite, having a big pound of, you know, fiber introduced in your diet might not be the best thing. So just to be mindful of what, what's in the protein powder. Okay. So it kind of doesn't matter like what type of protein you get. It's it's what's carried along with it. Is that what you say, you're saying? Some, some, yes, in some cases, yes. Because yeah. it, it could cause more like distress, yeah. intestinal distress. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Whey, what, the, the, the great thing about whey is that it's really easily digested. Okay. Um, and then from Ed, we have, can a vegan diet help prevent recurrence of pancreatic cancer and what foods should be avoided? What foods are helpful? Okay. So in terms of recurrence and general, um, uh, what we know about prevention, uh, we don't know a lot is the problem. Um, some things that we do know is just maintaining whatever a healthy body weight. So trying to get close to uh, a BMI within a, a, a healthy range and um, uh, smoking. Those two are pretty clearly related to um, pancreatic cancer. Apart from that, it's all maybe. So even alcohol is maybe. <laughs> Red meat is a maybe. Nothing about fish or chicken, though. So a, a vegan diet isn't necessary. That's a personal choice, but not necessary. Red meat is a maybe. Processed meat, so deli meats, are also a maybe. Um, high diet, uh, high, uh, high in fruits and vegetables, and fiber. So it's not very different from just normal nutrition, again. Uh, but we don't know. We don't have any food that we say, you eat that, you are at risk of, of getting pancreatic cancer. Okay. Is there any correlation with like processed sugar intake? No. Okay. Even diabetes is a maybe. Okay. Interesting. And then um, one more from Catherine. We have, is egg white powder in your smoothie a good protein source instead of whey? And is sure. it evenly absorbable? Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I've had patients that, that they don't like the taste of whey because it has a taste and they mm -hmm. prefer egg white. Uh, it's, I find it's just not easily available to people here, but uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, I think that's all our questions for now. Thank you, Poppy. Okay. So we'll move on to the next part of uh, the presentation, which is really about pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. So this is why I have this scale here, the oh my God scale. I'm, I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat, but I'm still losing weight, so one now. So I just want to give you a little, uh, uh, I guess, biology lesson. You will be tested on the way out of the presentation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you won't be tested. <laughs> but I find it's nice to see like what happens when we eat to explain uh, what this exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is. Because for most of us, we've never thought about our pancreas until something like this happens, right? It's just something that's there. Um, so the digestive function of the pancreas is to release what's called enzymes. So these are molecules that break down protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So these are all the main nutrients in our food. So protein, fat, sugar. It also releases bicarbonate. So what happens is that uh, there's a lot of acid coming from our stomach into our intestine. And if we were to leave that acid as is, go into the intestine, the intestine would have holes burnt through it, essentially. You would have ulcers in your intestine. So the pancreas releases this bicarbonate to reduce that acidity. So two functions of the pancreas. So I'll we'll sort of walk you through the digestive tract here. So we eat, we chew food, and the food comes down into the stomach, okay? And then it sort of, sort of slowly gets squirted out into the intestine, okay? Oops, I lost my cursor, into the intestine. Now, when the food goes into the intestine, two things happen. The intestine sort of um, signals to the gallbladder here and the pancreas here, hey, food is here. We got to break this food down so the nutrients could get absorbed in the intestine. So the gallbladder's job is to release 
bile. Bile allows for fat to be broken down. The pancreas, as I mentioned before, releases the pancreatic uh, juices, which include the bicarbonate to neutralize the acid. And then it releases the enzymes to break down the fat, the, the protein and the carbohydrates. Once the food is broken down, it travels through the small intestine and it gets slowly absorbed into the blood and into our body so that the sugars could feed uh, and the fat could feed our cells and our the proteins could be used in various processes in the body, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what normally happens. Oh, and sorry, it's incredible when you think about it because this process could um, create up to 1.5 liters of pancreatic juice every day. So that for our American friends is six cups, okay? Six cups of this pancreatic juice, which is just a, such a horrible <laughs> word, but that's what it's called, <laughs> pancreatic juice. So it's, it's a lot of activity that this, our pancreas is uh, doing to break down our foods to allow for the absorption. So what happens when there's exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? So on the left here is the normal pathway. So the enzymes are released, the food is broken down, the food goes into the uh, intestine and gets absorbed. Say there's a tumor here in the pancreas, it's blocking this duct here, or um, you know the, the tumor is uh, destroying the cells where all these pancreatic juices are being made. So there could be many reasons why the enzymes aren't being released but the food doesn't get digested. You see, it doesn't get broken down. It sort of stays as is. And it travels through the intestine and the nutrients are not absorbed. And at the same time, as it travels down, it sort of brings water into the intestine. And this is that classic diarrhea that you see, okay, happening. The nutrients aren't absorbed. It's bringing water in, comes out as diarrhea. What happens in the case of surgery. I'm going to show you what a Whipple surgery is because I'm not sure if everyone, you know, sometimes surgeons just don't have the time to explain exactly what's going on. So generally Whipple surgery is done when the tumor is in the head of the pancreas. So the pancreas has a head, has a body, and has a tail. So the Whipples will uh, focus on uh, cancers that are in the head of the pancreas. And what they remove is the head of the pancreas, of course, where the tumor is, but they also remove the gallbladder and they remove the first part of the small intestine. Sometimes they even remove part of the stomach, that, depending on what's going on with the tumor. Sometimes the tumor is pressing up into the stomach. But generally speaking, this is what a Whipple's is sort of chopping out. So that's three major things, part of your intestine, part of your gallbladder, or sorry, your gallbladder and part of your pancreas. And then they have to sew it back together. Look at the change in the anatomy. First of all, we don't have a gallbladder and a gallbladder really holds bile and is able to synchronize when the intestine says, hey, food is here, synchronize how the bile is released. The, so there's no uh, gallbladder. So the bile just sort of drips down whenever, okay? Not synchronized when, when food enters the, the intestine. Then you have the pancreas. Well, a whole bunch of that enzyme producing part is gone. Okay, so fewer enzymes are produced. Sometimes depending on how much of the pancreas is removed, no enzymes are produced or absolutely fewer, an insufficient number of enzymes are produced. And then look at where the food goes in. It goes in below where those enzymes come in and where the bile is coming in. Whereas before the food comes in first and then that gets hit by the bile and the enzymes. So here we have like a, a ballet that's gone wrong, right? The dance is not happening, the, there's missteps and, and you know, we were all watching the Olympics, you know, the, the, the figure skaters who fall, that's what's happening here. It's not coordinated at all. Um, so there's a big mess in terms of your anatomy. And this is what causes some of those symptoms of uh, gas, bloat and diarrhea. And here we are, the signs and symptoms that this is going on. You have gas, bloat, cramps. Your stool will be either loose or frank diarrhea, which is really like water in the bowl. 
the stool will, uh, patients tell me it stinks. It's not a normal smell. It's very odiferous. It's not, it's, it's foul. And the color of the stool, even if it's not diarrhea, if it's form, the color might be off. It might be pale. It might be beige. Some patients tell me it's mustard yellow. And sometimes when you look at the, the uh, water in the bowl after a bowel movement, you'll actually see this like greasy film. So you actually see that the fat or the oil in your food has gone right through, hasn't been absorbed at all, and it's just floating on the water in the toilet bowl. The problem with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is that not everyone has this. What I'm describing here is like the worst case scenario, but you could have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency without having these signs and symptoms. So because every individual is different, the signs and symptoms are different for everyone and the severity of those signs and symptoms are different for everyone. Okay, so how do we know that someone has exocrine pancreatic insufficiency when they're not having diarrhea every two seconds? Well, we could think of, well, where is the tumor? Is it in the head of the pancreas? Has the patient had a Whipple's? Has the patient had their whole pancreas removed? Clearly, they're not going to be making enough enzymes. Okay, so it's beyond just looking for diarrhea. Is the patient losing weight despite eating? That's a big sign. Uh, they're not absorbing the nutrients. It's all for naught. There, is, uh, there are quite a few different tests to actually test for uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. The most common in the literature is the fecal elastase test. And this fecal elastase is basically some, a, a molecule that's part of the pancreatic juice. And basically, if it, there's not any in your stool or very little in your stool, it's because your pancreas isn't producing it. So that, that's how the diagnosis would be made with a test. I don't know, in my center, this test is never done. Um, if we wanted to have this test done, we'd have to send the stool samples outside. And we're like a, a major teaching hospital. So it's not something widely used as far as I know. Most, um, and even in the clinical practice guidelines, the diagnosis should be made based on the symptoms, essentially, and the tumor location, the type of surgery, if the tumor is blocking the, the ducts, uh, those kinds of, uh, of issues. So how common is this problem? 72% of patients who cannot have surgery. So if the tumor is too large to have surgery, you probably have some form of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency more common in the head versus the tail of the pancreas, because that's where most of the cells that create the pancreatic juice are located. And in patients uh, before Whipple's, 44% might have it, but after surgery, 74%. So um, Chiara, that's like what, you know, your, your husband is likely insufficient. And this is a problem that's very undertreated. So uh, just some statistics that I found from recently published in the US, 22% treated and of the treatment in those 22%, 90% weren't even getting enough of the replacement. And in the UK, 74% of those going for surgery, but only 45% of those that are ineligible for surgery. And if you remember before, the ones going in for surgery had less of a chance of having insufficiency than the ones that weren't eligible for surgery. So we're doing this all backwards. We're not doing a good job of uh, taking this seriously, diagnosing it, treating it. So what do we do? It's called pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy or PERT. And essentially what PERT is, is capsules that contain the enzymes that we need, uh, that we take when we eat. Okay, our pancreas isn't making enough, might be making some, but just not enough. Our pancreas does not shoot them out into the intestine at the proper time at the proper place. So we need to replace. Um, we must take these enzymes while eating. In my center, I have a surgeon who tells all the patients to take them half an hour before. I don't know why, because they're gone <laughs> by the time the food comes in. So you have to take them while you're eating. If, you're, if it takes you a long time to eat, if you're eating a large meal, you might want to take some at the beginning of the meal, some in the middle of the meal, even some at the end of the meal, depending on how long that meal lasts, because you want the enzymes there along with the food. You want to dose it based on the fat content of a meal or snack. So again, it's so individual. Hopefully you could work with a dietitian. 
Um, what I have patients do when it's really not working well and we're trying to figure out why is I'll ask my patients to keep a food diary, to keep the number of capsules they're taking at meals, like what their habit is, when they're taking them, and to report the digestive system, the symptoms. And that way we could dose accordingly. The, usually what we'll say is, you, for example, we'll use a brand name here. We'll use Creon 25 because that's something that's very commonly prescribed. So we'll say three with meals, one to two with snacks, depending on the fat content. So if you're having an apple, there's no fat. So you would just take one. If you're having um, a, a, a drink, like an insurer, maybe you would take two at that time. And again, maybe two is not enough. So we'd have to adjust. And hopefully you're able to work with a dietitian who could guide you. Okay, because again, it's very individual. Some people only need one Creon with a whole meal because of how much of their pancreas is left and how much enzyme it's able to produce. So that's, it's very hard to make a blanket statement. And what is the goal of PERT? It's really to relieve those abdominal uh, symptoms, to slow down weight loss. There is an absolute relationship uh, between patients who take PERT and quality of life improvements. Of course, imagine you're not having gas and diarrhea every time you eat, your, your life is gonna be better. You're gonna enjoy your meals more. It's not gonna be uh, a struggle. And uh, actually, uh, Stephanie had arranged for a talk with um, Dr. Enrico Dominguez Munoz, who is an expert in PERT. And he showed a study which demonstrated that PERT is just as effective as um, chemotherapy in prolonging or overall survivor in, so overall survival, excuse me, in cancer or in pancreatic cancer. So PERT is a very important part of this. And as, as caregivers and as patients, I'm hoping that this information will empower you to ask your treating team. It's important. And there's nothing, um, there are very few side effects of PERT. Sometimes people don't um, get gas or bloat. Uh, we've had situations where patients actually get more diarrhea once they're on PERT. It's rare. And it's really about the formulation, the capsule itself. Some people are intolerant to the capsule. But there are ways around it. You could open the capsule, putting it into something acidic, because if you open the capsule and put it in your mouth, you're going to start digesting your mouth. So we don't want that. But something like an applesauce, you take the applesauce mixed with the, 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 the contents of the uh, capsule, and that relieves some of the symptoms. So there's always like things to, to try. There are also, Creon isn't the only game in town. There are other type of uh, PERT capsules. And asking your healthcare provider to actually change the type of uh, enzyme replacement therapy prescribed might help as well, just for tolerance. So very important, and I can't state it enough to nag about this. <laughs> he also made a point that was, you know, I'll just jump in there. You know, uh, when he was speaking, he was speaking at our um, national pancreas conference with healthcare um, professionals from across Canada, and he said. If this was seen as a chemotherapy, it would be a standard of care. And the other point, meaning that, you know, every patient should be receiving this. And he was also saying, you know, um, you know, the the assessment of whether or not you have pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, you know, may not be able to be done, or it's not always accurate, but it can't hurt anybody. So he said, you're you're better to go on the safe side and assume that you have pancreatic enzyme insufficiency and treat it. Um, as opposed to not receive that treatment because it can't hurt. Almost three quarters of patients have it. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be prescribing it at diagnosis. And in my practice, that's what I do. I chase people around to prescribe for it. So I'll take questions about that right now. Okay, we have a few in the chat. Um, one was kind of more related to our last series of questions, so we'll just get that out of the way, but someone was asking um, if there's a way to get a single ingredient protein supplement. Uh, meaning like uh, amino acids? I, um, I think they just mean like a protein powder that doesn't have other like additives in it. 
Oh but yeah, there there are some pharmaceutical um, products that we use. So they come from you know Nestle or whatever. They're pharmaceutical grade. They could be prescribed, and those are just, for example, whey protein isolate. Okay. Because if you you're right, if you go to a health food store, you might have a protein powder that has a huge list of ingredients of other things added in there. So, okay, that's great. And then David was asking, are pancreatic enzymes only produced when signaled by other organs seeing food, and can the pancreas not produce enzymes at the right times after the Whipple? Um, there's a disconnect about the timing, and there's a disconnect about how many how much of the pancreas is left that produces the enzyme. So it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, and then Michael chimed in and said, but the last day's test isn't accurate if you're already using enzyme supplements. Is that, is that true? Um, I'm not, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Honestly, we don't use the last days. I okay. don't, uh, I've, I've never had a patient have an last day's test. Okay. Um, then I would go with symptoms. A last days is also not accurate if there's a lot of uh, diarrhea because of the dilution. So okay. a last days is not the best, like there is no um, gold standard test. It's a last days is the test that's used most often. Okay, interesting. And then David was asking, um, a recent PanCan Nutrition webinar said that the fecal elastase one test used used to be the gold standard, but they are not sure anymore. Is there any, is there another lab test? Obviously a lot of doctors default to not needing enzyme supplements. But I think you were just saying there is no gold standard. <laughs> not that I know of. There are different, there's a breath test that you could take, but that's very burdensome. Um, because you have to take these markers for like five, six days beforehand. Uh, there, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other tests. There are different tests and I could get back to you with that information if you'd like. Um, but but um, if, if he wants to send, you know, his email address or something to, to me, I don't know how we could do that, but, uh, um, sure. Uh, but you I'm, could forward it to us and we could forward it to. to yeah, David. I could get you that information. It's out there. That would be great. Um, and then David was saying the official enzyme instructions seem to be aimed at cystic fibrosis patients. Are there any instructions for pancreatic cancer patients or do we have to just trial and error it? Uh, it's, it's trial and error. The yeah. standard starting dose would be uh, 70 of uh, 5,000 units of lipase for meals and 25 to 50,000 units for snacks. Okay. And then there, there is, you know, you can't uh, take it ad infinitum in the sense that uh, there are limits based on body weight, but uh, the three and two model, you, I don't think anyone would um, be exceeding anything. Okay. And then Susan just wanted to confirm for a snack with no fat in it, like you were mentioning an apple, you would take a single Creon? You can, because sometimes the carbs will ca cause gas. And that's, again, that's a trial and error thing. So you could try with one and you could try without. Have an apple one day, have an apple the other day. If there's no difference, then don't take one. But um, if you are experiencing gas from the carbohydrates, you might want to try one. Okay. Um, and then George is saying attempting radical remission approach to diet because of recurrence of pancreatic cancer after a Whipple radiation, three rounds of chemo. Um, diet is no red meat, no dairy, no sugar, no processed foods, no processed wheat, hard to maintain weight. Any suggestions? I, I honestly, I, I, totally understand wanting to change your diet is so radically to not get cancer again. I totally get it, but I find that very restrictive. Uh, I would suggest you meeting with, with a, a nutritionist, a dietitian, a registered dietitian to look at your diet, to see what could be liberalized. Maybe there's some wiggle room in what you're eating that would make you feel comfortable and that will meet your nutritional goals because losing weight and losing muscle isn't going to help you. 
I don't know if that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't really talk specifically to your case, but I, I do think you should, you know, talk to someone qualified to help you out with that. Okay. And then Chanya was asking about the price of Creon in Canada. Uh, they paid $1,800 um, in the US per month. Um, do you know if it's comparable I'm, in Canada? I'm gonna jump in there. Um, there was somebody and maybe Paul um, might be able to jump in there as well, but I believe it was on the last call. It was on one of our support care um, sessions and um, there was a gentleman in Texas that was talking about this, but in the States, um, the manufacturers have, um, uh, what's it called, a compassionate program. So there's a gentleman in Texas that actually applied for that compassionate program through um, the manufacturers for enzymes. I forget which one. And they actually were provided with enzymes for six of the 12 months each year um, for free. So it helped reduce the cost for that family. And, mm -hmm. and there was other patients, other Americans that were speaking up and said they'd all, also gone through the same process. Um, in Canada, we have drug navigators that help patients um, access medications that their medical won't cover. Um, but also for everybody on this call, if you go on the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition website, and Jessica, maybe I'll get you to put the link in there because I'm I don't I can't minimize my screen because I'm recording. Yep. But the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition website has um, over 100 members from all around the world. And many of those organizations have patient financial support grants like we do here in Canada with our, with our organization. So you can also apply for funding. So if you went on, you know, in the United States, if you went under the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition website and looked under the United States, you'll see a variety of organizations that provide financial support. So um, at the top underneath, above the membership, you'll see all the different programs the organizations provide. So you can click on the financial grants and you'll see um, all the American organizations that provide funding specifically um, for this um, as well. So, you know, the, there's the, the manufacturers that you can contact directly for, you know, compassionate programs. There's the organizations in the United States that can provide funding as well as, as well as many other countries. And then there's drug navigators in, in Canada. Hopefully that will help. Yeah, the link is in the chat there for anyone that's interested in checking that out. Um, Alicia was asking if- I think uh, Stephen also added some links in there to everybody as well. It looks okay. like the programs as well. Yeah, um, someone was asking if probiotics should be used along with PERT to improve gut health. That's a good question. There, in, in the literature, the use of probiotics when you're on chemotherapy, it's unclear in terms of safety because it's, it's a bacteria we're introducing um, and we're immunocompromised while on chemotherapy. Um, the, the literature is so mixed on this as a, a standard operations at the McGill University Health Center and all our hospital sites, we, um, we do not suggest anyone take probiotic while on treatment. If you're not on treatment, then there's no harm in, in doing it. You could uh, you know, check with the, your pharmacist or a healthcare provider to get a good uh, probiotic uh, that's available in your area. Um, but during chemotherapy, I would not recommend it, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul, you, you said in the chat that you have a question for Poppy, if you wanna chime in. That is such a good question. Um, it happens, but in, in my experience, it's so hard to tease out whether it's the enzymes, mm -hmm. whether it's the chemotherapy, whether it's some of the uh, anti-nausea vomiting medications that we take that constipate, such right. as Zofran, um, whether it's pain medication that we may or may not be on, mm -hmm. it's really hard to tease out. The test, one test you could, you could have your mom do is again, she could open the capsule into applesauce mm -hmm. and try it that way. 
um, or she could ask her family doctor to prescribe her a different type of pancreatitis. So mm. there are other types. There's uh, co-design, there's Vicase, there's different types. It's not just, Creon isn't the only game in town. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, it could happen, absolutely. But it's really, in my practice, very hard to tease out mm -hmm. what is causing the constipation. So I think David, David, do you have a question as well? Your hand is up. Um, I think that's a great idea for the vitamin D and any multivitamin, actually. You might as well take it at the same time as you're eating and you're using the Creon. Um, an oral nutritional supplement as well. You know, if you're going to go ahead and take insures or protein powders, use, use your Creon at the same time. Um, I, I don't know of any uh, frank uh, interactions with medication. I'm trying to think, There's, nothing's coming to mind just off the top of my head. If I think of something though, I'll, I'll tell you. But I think that's a really good call about the vitamin D. And in fact, I've seen patients on the uh, uh, 10 and 20,000 international units of vitamin D a week, they weren't taking with Creon and they were vitamin D insufficient. And as soon as they started taking it with the Creon, their vitamin D levels rose, so it's important. Juice was asking um, if you could compare BioCase, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, to Creon. It's just a different type of pancreatitis. Um, like I said, it's a matter, we always use Creon as the first one because it's easily accessible in pharmacies. It's covered here in Quebec, it's covered by our government insurance companies. If you have a private insurance, must cover it because the government covers it. So we're really spoiled here. Um, but, uh, it's just a matter of tolerance. They, they both work well. Okay. And then for, for those that are interested in supplementing with probiotics, if they're not on treatment, presumably, um, does yogurt or kefir, kefir <laughs> uh, work for that? Sure. Okay. And it's delicious. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, people are like sharing information back and forth, but I think that's the end of our questions for now. Okay. So what, what I'll go on with now is the final part of the presentation. And it's really about, okay, I'm doing everything you just said, Poppy. Okay, I'm listening, I'm doing, I've nagged my doctor, I'm getting my perk. Why am I still losing weight? Um, and here is, oops. Sorry about that. So here is where I'd like to introduce the concept of cancer cachexia. Has anyone, maybe a show of hands again, um, has anyone ever heard of cancer cachexia? Has anyone ever talked to you about it? I don't okay, so I see, I, see. I see like four hands. Yeah, I see, not very many. Not very many. Yeah. So cancer cachexia is actually present in 70% of patients with pancreatic cancer at diagnosis. Cancer cachexia is a problem not necessarily only in cancer, because we see it in patients with cardiac problems. We see it in patients with lung disease. It's a disease of inflammation. This inflammation is all over the body. Okay. The inflammation causes are uh, nutrients not to be used properly. We burn a lot of calories and we lose weight because we're not able to eat enough to burn all those calories. And even if we were to eat enough, we're burning so many calories, it might not make a difference. The inflammation also affects our brain. And in the centers of our brain that are responsible for our appetite, the inflammation causes all those centers to turn off. So we actually have no hunger and it's in our brain. It's not us being difficult. It's not us, you know, being picky about food. It's we have inflammation in our brain that causes us not want to want to eat. Um, the only thing that will sort of control this inflammation is chemotherapy or your treatments, okay? Um, or the surgery to remove the tumor or radiation therapy, you know, on the tumor to sort of 
tame the tumor. So the inflammation drops and then we could eat and actually stop losing weight and we could actually have an appetite and want to eat. But there is really no cure for cancer cachexia. So in patients who are receiving, who are non-resectable, for example, and are receiving chemotherapy, as long as the chemotherapy has having an effect on the inflammation caused by the tumor, you won't have cancer cachexia. Cancer cachexia is a whole continuum of, of a disease. It could be like sort of mild and sort of end stage type thing, but there is no cure at the moment for cancer cachexia. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about that I find no one talks to patients about is how cancer cachexia leads to um, an issue called eating related distress. And this eating related distress is caused by a, the patient suddenly not being able to eat, not having an appetite, which could cause a difficulties with the relationships between the patient and their caregivers, the patient and their families, the patient and their friends. And it's, it causes a difficulty in the changing roles of the patient um, because of the cachexia and because of the eating related distress. So for example, someone who has been a lifelong cook, loves to cook, loves to eat, suddenly cannot do it because they're not feeling well, they have cachexia, they've lost weight, they're weak, they have no appetite. And the caregiver suddenly has to cook for the patient. This role change is very difficult for people to accept sometimes. Um, difficulty re relationships because patients don't necessarily, people who are experiencing eating related distress don't necessarily want to go out to eat, don't want to go to a birthday party, don't want to be around food. So all this, I can't tell you how many times in my practice I've, I've had to act as a marriage counselor and I'm not at all qualified for that, but it's, it's really a problem. So I just wanted to go through some of the things that I've heard in my practice from patients and the caregivers. So one patient was telling me how he only wanted one slice of ham in his sandwich because the thought of two was such a turnoff, he could not eat them. He could not eat a second slice of ham. And the wife was saying how, no, 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 she was insisting that's not enough protein. One slice of ham will not do it. You must have two slices of ham. So another example, a patient who really had quite advanced pancreatic cancer and cachexia was telling me how the only thing that would go down is a fast food cheeseburger. It was the only thing that tasted good and that he enjoyed. And his wife was so upset because I was saying, yes, have the cheeseburger. And the wife was, oh my goodness, it's junk food. It's not good for him. Why should he have a cheeseburger? Then a caregiver who told me I make all her favorite foods, but she doesn't want to eat anything. And he was crying and upset because of this. And then another patient who told me I can't sit, I can't even sit at the table with my family anymore because just the sight of food and the sight of everyone eating is, is too much for me. It makes my appetite worse. So you could see how these relationships get sort of flipped on a dime and, and people have trouble because of uh, the, the lack of appetite, because of the weight loss, all leading to this eating related distress. So uh, oftentimes our instinct is not very helpful. We wanna fight against the cachexia. We wanna fight against the eating related stress. But as I said, there's no cure. There's nothing, there's nothing that you could really do that will fight against the cachexia. So we must make our expectations realistic. And this is where I go into the whole quality of life thing. What's important to the person we're caring for? You know, um, what is realistic in terms of what he could eat? There's also just, no one talks about cancer cachexia. We have four hands go up here. I mean, no one talks about it and it's common in this type of cancer and you should be aware of it. Um, there's also not enough nutrition support. I don't know how many of you actually have, an, have access to a nutritionist in your centers, uh, but nutrition information and support is often not, not adequate. I literally had a patient who came from a center um, out in the suburbs of uh, Montreal who told me his nutrition intervention was being given a six pack of Insure by a nurse. So clearly that's not going to do anything. Um, and of course, the feelings of loss of control, helplessness, frustration cause again, 
Poppy to be marriage counselor between uh, caregiver and patient. Uh, so there are many conflicts over food, specifically. Um, a patient may no longer want certain things, not want to be around certain types of food. So like the diet of the household sort of changes. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the uh, family roles might switch around. The, the cook is the patient and the caregiver is not a cook and it causes difficulty. A big one is as caregivers, what can we do? We could offer food, we want our, our, our family member to eat. And that pressure is just, it, it makes everything worse for everyone. And then there's differences in beliefs and perceptions um, between uh, patients and family members. So sort of like that ham uh, example, protein, you need protein. Everyone's talking about protein, you know, and the patient's like, just leave me alone. I don't want the protein. <laughs> you know, I, I want to be able to eat something and enjoy it. So what to do to counter this eating related distress? Um, the term palliative care has a negative connotation. When we hear palliative care, we think, oh my God, someone is dying, but it's not necessarily the case. And that's why nowadays we're also using the uh, friendlier term supportive care. These uh, palliative care teams are the experts at controlling all the symptoms around your cancer and the treatment. Accepting early referral to supportive and palliative care, even if you're far away from treatments no longer working, is important to improve quality of life. If you don't have symptoms, if you don't have pain, if you don't have constipation, if you don't have nausea, if you're able to eat a little something, clearly you're going to feel better. Clearly. Um, I have patients, for example, with peanuts, I've been seeing since 2015, and I'm a supportive care dietitian. So don't be afraid of that term. It's really about symptom management. Uh, other things to do, eat for pleasure. If cancer cachexia is really instilled, we no longer, the treatment is no longer working. Don't worry about what I said before in calories and protein, we eat for pleasure. As family members, we provide a calm, pleasant meal environment. We don't push the food. We serve small portions. We don't force anyone to eat. And something that I find very helpful with my patients is recommending that the caregivers do not talk about food. We're so used to, you know, getting up in the morning, oh, what do you want for supper? What do you want for lunch? When someone has a lack of appetite, it makes it worse because then it's in their head. Oh my God, in an hour, I'm going to have to eat that. And I can't. So it's best as caregivers, we sort of have an idea of what works, what goes in. Just make it and serve it. Don't talk about it. Don't, don't dwell on it. And it often um, alleviates some of this eating related distress between the couples. So that was that. And I'm happy to take more questions regarding anything. Jessica, did you wanna ask the questions that are popping up there? And then I'll keep an eye for the hands that are going up. So everyone, if you have a question, just put your hand up and uh, Jessica will make her way through the chat questions and then we'll also get uh, some of the hands that are up. Sure, um, so Crystal is saying, who do you ask for a specialist in nutrition? In some centers there are actually dietitians who are working within the cancer center. If not, I would ask um, the oncology team if they could uh, recommend someone. I mean, every center is different. And um, in, in Quebec, if you're not seen by someone in the hospital, you have to go private. Um, there are very, very few publicly funded services outside of the hospital. So um, it's, it's, it depends on, are you lucky enough to live in an urban area with a huge hospital center that'll have mm -hmm. that service? And if not, I would ask the medical team. Okay. And should, should patients be looking for a dietitian that specializes like with cancer patients or would a, a regular um, like non-specialized dietitian be able to, to help as well? In theory, we could all help. Of course, if yeah. you have someone who's specialized, they'll have a little mm -hmm. bit more of the nitty gritty. But in theory, all dietitians could, 
could help. Any right. dietitian working in a hospital seeing cancer patients without being an oncology specialist because patients with cancer might be on every ward of the hospital. Yeah, um, I think that's it for the chat. Steph, if we wanna to move to people with their hands raised. Uh, there's a question that came up in the chat again from Michael. Jessica, are you able to read that? Yeah, um, Michael's asking, our infusion center has an oncology dietitian on staff who does rounds visiting every patient in treatment. Okay. Yes, a statement. <laughs> that, that's great that you have someone seeing every patient. The volume in our center is such that we have to triage our patients so we don't see every patient. Although we do see, I would say, 95% of the patients with pancreatic cancer receiving chemotherapy, not the surgical ones, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Cheryl is saying, my mom is pancreatic insufficient and yesterday they drained three liters of fluid from her stomach. Where can I find info on ascites and life expectancy? Ooh, that would be something to talk to your oncology team about. Okay. Um, we also have, Jessica, maybe, um, you know, once again, I can't lower my screen, but um, Cheryl, on our website under support for caregivers, there's, um, Many, many videos, but in one in particular that would answer that question is by, um, her first name is Valerie. Um, I forget the last name of the speaker, but she speaks, um, she's a palliative and hospice care nurse, and she speaks specifically about the question that you're asking. Um, so Jessica, maybe if you can find that video yep. um, and put that in the chat for her, then uh, that video, I think, will answer a lot of your questions. And we have a question from Brent. Brent, did you want to ask a question? I don't know if you're on. I'll ask here. It says, Poppy, do you need, um, do people in, in your profession conduct telehealth calls and consultations? We live seven hours away from where the Whipple was performed. So do not, so they're not down the street for an appointment, which is a really good question. Brent, COVID has brought us into the 21st century. And for the last two months, because of shutdowns here in Quebec, I've been doing only telehealth. So yes, we do. And yeah, just, you are a perfect, the perfect example of why we should do telehealth. Yeah. Organized um, in the United States, PanCan has a patient referral center, Brent, and um, they would probably be able to tell you exactly um, who could do the teleconferences with you if if your own um, surgeon is able to provide you with that information. I'm, I'm thinking your surgeon will also be able to provide you with that information, but if not, FanCan's Patient Referral Center is excellent. And I'll get Jessica to pop that um, their link for the patient referral, Jessica, into the, into the chat for Brent. It's such a good question. Um, at our center, we're the old school. We will not recommend antioxidants for sure. Mm -hmm. the, right. the oncology pharmacists put a big X on that, mm -hmm. um, as they do with the probiotics, oh. which in, in, certain, in certain cancers, actually, and now with these new immunotherapies, there's been some work looking at, uh, I'm, I'm thinking probiotics, sorry to just veer off, but there's some work looking at maintaining a healthy gut microbiome when you're on immunotherapy is super important, especially after getting bombed with chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, we don't know. And the thinking is out of an abundance of caution, since we're getting chemotherapy, we don't want to do anything that might affect or work counter to the chemotherapy. Right. So until I see those studies that are really high quality and mm -hmm. that really show, demonstrate a good effect, I would, I would say I'd rather just play it safe. Um, especially in, in, in pancreatic cancer, we know that the chemotherapies don't work very well. Right. Partly because of the type of tumor, the way the tumor is built, mm -hmm. the tumor doesn't have much vasculature, um, so the chemo doesn't get in there. Very well, correct. 
Yeah. So, you know, it's really, a, I, we do not, as our standard practice recommended and the guidelines don't recommend any sort of antioxidant therapy at the present. Um, ASCO has been just released guidelines for cancer and no one is recommending antioxidants. Mm -hmm. um, Karen had sent a, 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 in the chat a, just a back message, but I think it was for the whole group. And it was, are you saying to avoid your yogurt during chemo? We are using Greek yogurt in smoothies instead of boost type drinks. Oh no, Yo Greek yogurt is wonderful. You just don't want it um, containing extra probiotics. So just look at the label. Usually these companies are super happy to market probiotic on the front, <laughs> but regular Greek yogurt, delicious. Enjoy, better than uh, an insure, for sure, in a nice smoothie. Okay, great. Jessica, do you want to, there's a few more there for everybody for the questions. Mm, sure. George is saying, I have two infusion centers in major cities. One says get a cheeseburger and malt, and the other has a full nutrition section that will follow up with me every month. Fight for solid nutrition information like we are receiving today. Okay, excellent yeah. info today. Sorry, I'm just catching up on, on what's actually questioned. Um, uh, actually, um, somebody posted about the National Pancreas Foundation um, having a cookbook. Um, and I'm, I just asked Jessica to post another link to the Selgin's cookbook, which was for specific for pancreatic cancer. The National Pancreas Foundation also has a series of videos for patients on almost any topic that you can um, think of in pancreatic cancer. The videos are usually between two and three minutes and they're excellent videos. And we actually have them posted on our website as well. So, um, you know, it's certainly a great resource as well. I agree, we need to fight for proper nutrition education in every oncology center. <laughs> and we, we, we don't have enough, we don't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have any comments, Poppy, on fasting regimens to improve chemo effectiveness or tolerance? <laughs> Again, a topic, a hot topic, something being researched right now, it, doesn't seem to do anything, but to be seen. Um, even in, in reviews that I've read recently, looking at fasting, um, the authors who are clearly pro-fasting uh, at the end say, we cannot recommend this to anyone yet. A lot more research has to be done. Um, you know, it's... I wish it were true. I wish we knew for sure that it worked, but we don't yet. And what I worry about if a patient comes to me and they're fasting is what is it doing to their muscle? When we lose muscle, we don't tolerate chemotherapy as well. We have more side effects to chemotherapy. That's why I'm crazy about protein and walking and moving. And if you could get some exercise advice, that's what I would recommend because when we lose muscle, we don't tolerate our chemotherapy. And what happens when we're not tolerating our chemotherapy? We're fatigued, we're run down, we can't do our stuff. We see our oncologist, the oncologist reduces the dose of the treatment or we'll change your treatment regimen completely. That's what we're trying to avoid. So I, that's my concern about fasting. There are some very few studies that show, oh, it doesn't do anything to muscle. But at the same time, there are other studies that show it does. And you have to be careful because if you get into that downward spiral and if there's the presence of inflammation that is leading you towards cachexia, uh, fasting is not going to help. And in fact, what they did say is that if anyone is to try it, only surgical patients, only surgical patients before surgery. If they're re receiving chemotherapy during surgery, before surgery, oh, and in the conditions that were just mentioned, that you're not malnourished to begin with, okay? Uh, Paul is absolutely right. And um, only in those conditions, and I could tell you, because <laughs> I've been working in prehabilitation, which is diet and exercise and a uh, um, uh, relaxation treatments that we've been giving patients awaiting a Whipple's. Um, before surgery, 
and I work with one of the godfathers of rehabilitation to prepare patients for surgery. And he is completely against this because of the low protein intake, low uh, possible weight loss, possible muscle loss. So again, it's like, there's two very, very different schools of thought. We don't know yet what fasting could do to, to be seen, to be seen, because there is research being done. You know, it, what, what I always try with my patients is to work within what they are doing. Um, I'm not going to dictate to someone, no, you're not going to do a keto exactly. diet. No, no, no. I will help them within the confines of what they're willing to do because we have to be respectful of everyone's choices. And food is something that you could control as a caregiver and as a patient. You can't control chemo, you can't control surgery, you can't control radiation, you can't control anything else. Food you could control. So what can we do within the beliefs of the patient and the beliefs of the caregivers? Sometimes what I find with these, like what they call fad diet, let's say under research diets, okay? is that it causes a lot of strain within the family. Yes, yes. Either because the patient absolutely wants it and it's causing trouble or the family yeah. is pushing it on the patient who doesn't want it. And that is a big problem. Um, Chania, I, Chania, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that, was asking about if you take any referrals outside of, you know, outside of Quebec. I think Chania said she's in Ontario. Um, you know, I think you've impressed a lot of people here. So you, uh, we have a lot of people reaching out, but if like, do you do tell, I assume that you're dealing with the patients with a McGill university. Yes. Yes. And then it is maybe what we can do is, um, for Chania, I would, I guess I would suggest that she's asking her specialist that the, she's with the Jaravinsky hospital. I'm assuming that we, she would have to go back to Jaravinsky hospital and ask for a nutritionist there? Ideally, I don't know. Um, Ideally, I, I yeah. don't know what they have in terms of. Um, yeah, Jenny, I, I might be able to reach out to you as well with some suggestions. Um, Maxine was um, asking about a, a, a natural path. I'm just kind of stepping in there. Sorry, Jessica, about helpful supplements and new treatments. Um, we also have a support for caregiver video on natural path medicine um but i would really watch the video and just make sure that there's a very clear communication between um the natural path um and your physician um your specialist that you're dealing with um you know there's many naturopathic medicines that can actually derail um chemotherapy so you know something as simple as um vitamin C infusions. Um, you know, we think of it as a natural supplement, but we really need to make sure that um, your naturopathic doctor is, is, you know, part of the team that's working with you and, and your physician. Um, you know, that was Did one of the- There are a lot of interactions with chemotherapy, yeah. um, including um, some supplements will cause your platelets to drop and chemotherapy might be causing your platelets to drop. And if they drop too low, you could actually bleed out from a small cut. Yeah. So these aren't benign little problems. So um, in our center, we actually have uh, pharmacists who speak to all patients before starting chemo to go through the list of any supplement they'd be, be taking. And if there's no interaction, they have no problem with yeah. you taking them. Yeah. So they're, like Stephanie said, that clear communication has to be established. Yeah, I think that's, you know, great to have, like, you know, there's a lot of physicians that will work with natural path teams and stuff. But we also know that there is a lot of um, patients that have been told by their natural path um, team not to tell the physician that they're on a certain supplement. Um, and uh, that's where it can get a little, a little scary for patients and, and frustrating for the physicians that are treating them. Not that they're all like that. It's just that, you know, it's just one one uh, little tip that we that has come up through Craig's Cause and the Ask a Doctor program and the physicians that we work with. Um, the other thing, Poppy, and we can talk about this after. Um, I'm just, I, and I know that Dr. Bruce Caldwell and there's a physician out of Ottawa that does a lot of um, promotion, like you know, awareness about PERT. 
there was a little table that they had about the PERT dosage, and it had different examples of the different treatments. I'm just wondering if that's something that we can get to this group here um, when I also provide them with the edited video so that there's like a little reference chart that they can use when they're looking at, you know, how much prion or different enzymes they give to their loved ones or that they take themselves with different meals and different, different, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would be great. So, you know, like it's great to have this, but sometimes I know, well, for me, I, uh, you know, when I got all the information, every visit I had with my dad, sometimes, you know, I heard it and then I would forget it. So it might be nice to have something that people can refer to in print. Um, That's good. I'll let you take over the chat again. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, no problem. Um, there's just a question from Elizabeth asking for any suggestions to reduce gas and abdominal cramping. Uh, she's already using Gas-X, Bentol, and Creon. Um, some people just get really sensitive to gas-causing foods. Um, so the, you know, cruciferous vegetables, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, the cabbages, the, if you're eating raw onions, if you're eating garlic, um, other, other than the, um, you know, switching the dosage of Creon, just maybe watching some of those gas causing foods to see if it'll help. Um, the dosage of Creon, of course, could be upped as a trial to see if it'll help as well. Um, and then, yeah, it's really hard to say just, just like that without seeing what you're eating and, and also just the meal size sometimes, maybe it's just too big a meal all at once. Um, one other suggestion I can make, um, you know, David brings up a good point, is um, sometimes people feel, you know, patients and caregivers feel a little, um, you know, that they're not confident in, in you know, advocating firmly for certain um, support. But, you know, um, us and so many other uh, pancreatic cancer organizations throughout the world really now has a lot of great information on their website and also the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition has um, defined some specific messaging about all of this. So if you brought in the information, you know, the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition has key messages, one of which is, is nutrition. So you have a hundred organizations saying, you know, patients live longer, they respond to chemotherapy or, or treatments and management better and they have a better quality of life with PERT. If you send, you know, if you bring in that messaging on paper, um, then it kind of takes the onus off the patients and the caregivers, and they can just say, "This is what we're being told." So this is what we want to we want to get. And we've been told sometimes patients feel a little less confrontational if they're saying that we've told them to ask for this. So it takes a little bit of that um, fear of of. Um, you know, annoying the doctor because it's it's our organization that's annoying the doctor as opposed to them directly. So people have said that they've found that a little bit helpful as well. Not if there's any other questions, but we this was a long session, but I hopefully it was a hope you know I hope it was a, a session that was helpful to many. We had a great turnout here and uh, some great discussions. Um, we will be sending out, um, Jessica, I know that um, a, somebody here was asking about the Pancreatic Cancer 101. I know we have it edited. Do you know where that is in terms of, of is it ready to be sent out to everybody? Um, the editing is just in the last stages, so it'll be ready probably through this week. Okay, so hopefully we can get this one edited um, also and 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 get it out to everybody sooner than the last one. The last one took a little bit longer. It just kind of depends on, of course, the, the workload of the editor that's doing this for us. But the videos will be sent out to everybody through the email, but also they'll be uploaded. And I'll talk to Poppy after this and, and try to get maybe some kind of table that we can get, um, that we can send out in a PDF for everybody to refer to. Um, helping with, you know, the dosage in, in terms of the food that's being eaten by the patient. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming and Poppy, you know, you, everybody loves you. 
Thank you all for coming. I, I love hearing from you and it makes me a better clinician knowing what you're going through. So yeah. we learn from each other. Yeah. So if the, if um, I'll just stay on a few more minutes longer, if anyone has any last minute questions or discussions or comments. And uh, if not, it's always the last Saturday of every month. And uh, next month is um, clinical trials, uh, I think, with Alison Ocean, who is world renowned in her work. She um, works really closely with I think she's on the board of Let's Win. So they yes. do. Um, uh, the third Tuesday of every year or every month they do um, tank chat, like it's a hashtag tank chat. So they have yeah. topics like we do monthly topics and then everyone joins a conversation on Twitter. And every time you respond and use the hashtag tank chat, then everybody can see all the questions and the discussions being populated. So it's kind of like a, a Twitter room if you use the, the hashtag and, and they have a series of questions and then they have experts from around the world responding to the questions. Oh, we have Stephen saying that uh, Alison Ocean was a part of his care team. Is there any other lasting questions? As I said, I'll stay on and, and Poppy, you're, you know, uh, you know, once again, thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll touch base by email and, uh, and I'll just stay on for a few moments. I hate being the first one to hang up. <laughs> I'll just wait for people and see you later, Judy. Keep them waving. Bye, David. That was excellent, Poppy. Thanks so much. I, I love everyone. Honestly, like it's always such a an interesting back and forth, and there's so much we don't know, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a great group. You know, like I think we're starting to see a lot of um, familiar faces, which is nice, and uh, certainly a lot more discussion occurs as people become more familiar with how the group is run and and. Uh, you know, and certainly great topics, you know, important topics. So um, I guess maybe I'm going to sign off in a couple more seconds and Poppy, I'll be in touch by email and, uh, okay. and we'll figure out how to get a PDF together for everybody.